Hello everyone. On behalf of Indian National Trust for Art and Culture Heritage, INTAC, and the INTAC Conservation Institutes, I extend a very warm welcome to our distinguished speaker, Jennifer Porter, and everyone who has joined us for today's talk in the Conservation Insights 2020 lecture series. I'm Dr. Padma Rohila, Director, ICI Delhi. Now to introduce our speaker, Jennifer Porter is a wall painting conservator an assistant lecturer in the Department of Conservation and Built Heritage at the University of Malta, where she coordinates lectures and directs students field projects for the MSc course in the conservation of decorative architectural surfaces. Currently, she's leading the department's projects to conserve the 16th century Matteo Perez the Elicio Great Siege Wall Painting Cycle in the Grand Master's Palace in Valletta. After obtaining an undergraduate degree in medieval and Renaissance studies at the University of Michigan, Ann Arbor, Porter studied for an MA in the conservation of wall paintings from the Couture Institute of Art in London. Since 2007, she has worked with institutions such as the Couture Institute of Art in UK, Instituto Nacional de Antropologia and Historia in Mexico, and the Getty Conservation Institute, USA, on field conservation and research projects in the Americas, Middle East, Europe and Asia, including sites such as the tomb of Tutankhamun in Luxor, Egypt. Porter enjoys applying a real life, uh, real world experience in the field as a freelance conservator and researcher to the development of a relevant and stimulating teaching program for future wall painting conservators. The title for today's talk is Preventive Conservation and Applied Ecology Balancing Natural and Cultural Values in the Design of a Bad Exclusion from the Temple of. Here, El Shelvet, Luxor, Egypt. Bats frequently inhabit cultural heritage sites and can play a significant role in the deterioration of historical architectural surfaces. These include wall paintings and polychrome decorations. While a range of strategies can and have been used to address bat colonization, this talk will focus on the process of excluding or passively removing bat populations from the temple of Deir El Shelvet in Egypt as a preventive conservation measure. The role of ethology, the study of animal behavior in the successful design of the intervention will be stressed, along with the importance of balancing the requirements of cultural, cultural heritage conservation with ecological preservation. Now, before I invite Jennifer for the talk, I request all of you to please mute your microphones, type in your questions in the chat box. Those will be taken right at the end of the talk. And also type in your name, organization name, and email address. We'd love to know who all have joined us today. So thank you, Jennifer. Thank you so much for doing it. A big thanks to Kiera also for organizing this and the University of Malta. So over to you now. Okay. Thank you, Padma, for the introduction. Um, I'm really happy to be taking part in this remarkable lecture series, um, which I think makes... Uh, is a very positive outcome from the terrible COVID situation that we all find ourselves in right now. So um, I think it's a really interesting outcome and a very nice series. Um, and yes, I think I'd like to thank her for inviting my department and also my colleague, Dr. Chiara Pazian, for um, extending this invitation to all of us in the department. Um, so as Padma has indicated, I'm going to be discussing uh, the informed exclusion of a bat colony from a temple in Luxor, Egypt. Um, and I chose this topic because I think it um, offers an interesting uh, change from many of the other lectures in the series, perhaps, which focus on many um, sort of applied conservation, more remedial treatments. And so I thought it was nice to bring in an element of preventive conservation. Um, I think it also hopefully will serve as an interesting case study um, demonstrating the often overlapping values which heritage sites can have for humans and also a wild animal population um, and invites us to see heritage sites as sort of a resource for both communities. Um, I'm hoping that this talk will be particularly relevant for conservators in India and other professionals in India because I think um, I imagine that you have many similar problems at sites in India. And in preparation for this talk, I did look for a few case studies and found a number of remarkable examples, um, both with bats, but of course, other types of wild animal populations, such as primates, which um, offer really fascinating case studies as well and problematics. Um, and I would just like to emphasize before I continue that I'm not promoting um, the exclusion of an animal population from a heritage site as the best or only solution. Um, 
when there is an overlap um, in use at these sites. Um, it was deemed the best solution for this particular case study. Um, but it, that the same decision making process may not be applicable at other sites. I do think, though, that um, this case study will offer sort of the methodology that was followed in this case study, um, the sort of thinking that went into it, the research that went into it, and sort of the bodies of information that were queried uh, to make informed decisions for this case study uh, will be relevant for um, considering other cases where um, animal populations need to be managed at heritage sites. And I think finally, it serves as a good example of um, the interdisciplinarity, which is so often necessary in the field of site con conservation in particular. Um, and uh, these very complex problems at very complex sites need to be um, tackled by a team of uh, experts. Um, so, so let's see, to move on. So before I begin, I'd just like to make sure that we're all on the same page as far as um, conservation terminology. I've put up the first three terms are from the ICOM CC um, terms that were agreed in sort of the 2008 uh, meeting. So preventive conservation, um, meaning all measures and actions which are aimed at avoiding and minimizing future deterioration and loss. And usually these interventions are indirect. Um, this can also be expressed as interventions which are aimed at um, addressing the causes of deterioration and, see, and tackling the causes of deterioration, whereas remedial conservation or restoration are often categorized as the um, interventions which are carried out directly on the object, so um, in contact with an object or a surface. Um, and of course, the restoration component um, being uh, more of the aesthetic addressing more of the aesthetic issues while remedial is addressing sort of more of the stabilization issues associated with those interventions. Um, and then separately, just to clarify, I think it came out already quite clearly in um, uh, Padma's introduction, but ethology meaning the study of animal behavior. So just to clarify the terms that I've used in the, in the title. Um, I'd also like to point out that this study is the subject of an article from 2013. So you can find uh, more complete details there about some of the work that I'll describe here. Um, and this talk, I think, actually served, or served as a very interesting opportunity to revisit this work, which was done almost 10 years ago, and sort of rethink some of the um, decision making and also um, look at the situation, how and if it has changed since then. So the exclusion of the bats from the temple at Daryl Shrewitt was only one component of a larger conservation project. Um, and this project had been designed and was carried out by the American Research Center in Egypt in Luxor. Um, and the main purpose of the project at the temple was to provide a training school for the professional development of Egyptian conservators. Um, and this training school was to take place over a two year period and three long campaigns. Um, and the training school was to focus on the conservation of polychrome bas-relief sculptural decoration, which was found within the temple. Um, and I was contracted to work on the 2012 pilot campaign for this project. Um, and my role was to sort of get the project up and going. Um, and that involved um, assessing deterioration and conservation problems, including ongoing risks, uh, preparing the site to accommodate the team of 25 to 30 people, which would be associated with the field school. So that would include conservators, students, technicians, laborers, that kind of thing. Um, a definition of the conservation approach and methods. And then also uh, we were to carry out treatment trials for the cleaning of the polychrome reliefs within the temple. Um, however, so I'm not sure if the ambient noise is problematic here. I apologize if so. Um, however, upon completion of the initial um, condition survey and discovery of this large colony of bats inhabiting the temple, the main focus of the pilot campaign turned to preventive conservation measures, um, and primarily those which were aimed at protecting the temple as a whole, so the bat conservation, but then other, some, sorry, some other elements as well, um, but also ensuring the safety of conservators, workers, and future visitors. So just to situate everyone, um, Luxor, of course, is within Egypt. Um, it's situated down in sort of the southeast of Egypt along the River Nile. Um, and zooming in a bit more, you see um, 
the city of Luxor sort of on the east bank of the Nile here, whereas the west bank of the um, Luxor area is more villages and agricultural land. And this is where many of the most well-known and the most significant um, archaeological sites, well, the bulk of the archaeological sites in the Luxor area are located. Um, and these are mainly sort of large mortuary complexes, both temples, but then also um, complexes such as the Valley of the Kings and the Queens, where you have complexes of uh, pharaonic period tombs. Um, and Daryl Shrewit is located at, in sort of the lower uh, left corner there. It's an outlier of, of this, in this region sort of geographically, but also um, temporally it's from the Greco-Roman period actually, rather than um, the pharaonic period. Um, and also uh, due to it's, it's not a mortuary temple, so it's an outlier in that sense as well. Um, but it's only about four kilometers distant from the Valley of the Kings and the Queens and sort of this, this um, area that's referred to as the, um, the Theban Mountains. Um, so now approaching the temple a bit closer, um, you can see that it's just a small, simple rectangular structure. And it's situated immediately at the interface between sort of the wild, barren desert lands and um, the cultivated lands um, that are used for agriculture. So you see um, sort of an irrigation canal bringing in water from the Nile here off to the left. Um, and this, of course, this situation, this location is extremely uh, important for the, um, well, it's one of the main reasons why the bats would have been interested in inhabiting this temple, um, because it really is, it provides ideal conditions for inhabitation. It would have been undisturbed, quite quiet, and yet there are all of the sort of food and water resources directly adjacent, which makes it very attractive. Um, now we're adjacent to the temple, and you can see that it's um, this small, simple rectangle that's um, com constructed of ash, uh, sorry, sandstone ashlars. Um, and there's one entry to the temple, which is uh, this door on the facade to the right. Um, and then you can also see that there are some small apertures in the facade on the left um, in the upper corner, which are windows, but most of the windows into the structure are very small um, like this. This is a plan of the temple. Um, and what you can notice is that you have the entry door on the east, which is the one that I pointed out in the previous slide. And this leads directly into the center chamber of the temple, which is called the Naus. Um, there's a corridor which runs all the way around the Naus and off from this corridor, there are a series of chapels um, and also a staircase which leads up to the roof of the temple. Um, what's important to notice is that there are no external doors um, except for the front door to the, to the temple. Um, of course, there are doors in each of the chapels, but they lead to this interior corridor. But each of the chapels does have sort of small windows and apertures for letting in light and air. Um, and this would have been very significant for um, the ritual purposes of the temple originally because there's very significant sort of restriction and control of the directionality of light within the space, um, which creates a lot of sort of um, ambiance. And you can imagine that it would have had quite a significant role in for ritual purposes. And this is documented in other sites. Um, but in addition, these same features are very significant, um, also play into uh, the attractiveness of the site for bats, uh, for a bat colony to inhabit. So there's limited light, um, airflow from the external desert where winds can often become quite high is also very restricted. And so it's a very protected interior space. Um, and in addition, because of sort of the, um, the heavy stone construction and the series of interior chambers, um, there's a lot of sort of thermal buffering from the extreme temperatures of the outdoor, of the outdoor desert environment. So this, all of these factors come together to create um, a very attractive space for baths. So a little bit more about the temple itself. Uh, as I said, it's a Greco-Roman era temple. So from the first to second century CE, um, and it's dedicated to the cult of Isis. And both of these factors are quite significant because um, this is one of the few Greco-Roman era uh, temples in the Luxor area. And it's the only one which is dedicated to the cult of Isis. So it's really um, a very particular site. In addition, the interior, mainly the naus, so that central chamber, but also other areas in the interior of the, the temple are decorated with 
polychrome bas relief decoration, which you can start to see in this image. Um, this is one wall, the east facing wall of the, um, the Naus, where you can see some of these uh, bas relief decorations on the walls. And they depict, among other things, there are inscriptions in, in hieroglyphs, um, and they depict images of Roman emperors making offerings to Isis and other Egyptian gods. But what's remarkable about these is that the Roman emperors are depicted as Egyptians. So all these factors together sort of come together to make this quite a particular and significant structure, despite its sort of outlier status within the, the larger um, complex of Luxor sites. Um, and this is just a detail from one of the bas-relief figures. Uh, what you notice immediately is sort of this blackish brown color of the entire surface. And this is due to reuse of the temple in later periods um, where it, the temple would have been inhabited and used for different purposes. And so what we actually see is that the surfaces of the bas-reliefs are covered in soot, um, other soiling materials such as waxes, and then there's also a heavy deposition of dust. Um, wind-blown dust from, from the exterior, which is deposited on these surfaces. So it's actually quite difficult often to, to see the polychrome, the polychromy, sorry. Um, but when you move in and examine these uh, reliefs in greater detail, you start to see the painted decoration. And so this is a figure of a goddess um, on the left here, and then to the right is a detail of her skirt um, and so what you start to realize is that the polychromy actually survives to a great extent, to a remarkable extent on these figures. Um, and they include a lot of important information about sort of um, Egypt, Egyptian textiles, um, the decoration and uh, preparation of textiles, um, other sorts of adornment, as well as, of course, um, painting technology from this period. So to return to the conservation issues in the temple, um, what types of deterioration did we find? Um, so I've mentioned the soot blackening and the dust, dust deposition. We did actually, during the initial condition survey, find evidence of um, water infiltration. Um, but the most significant source of ongoing deterioration was this large colony of bats, which we encountered inside, living inside the temple. Um, and what are the problems associated with bats? Um, I'm sure many of you or most of you are familiar with at least some of the potential problems associated bat with bats living in cultural heritage sites and in proximity to uh, humans. Um, one of the major ones is damage and deterioration of heritage materials. So that can take the form of staining and chemical deterioration, which is caused by urine and feces. So urine will splash onto surfaces uh, during flight. Urine and feces can uh, uh, collect on surfaces, um, on floors within spaces. Um, and sometimes you get really amazingly heavy accretions of crystallized um, excremental material. And this does drive deterioration um, of these surfaces, um, which is well documented in, in various sites around the world. Um, in addition, bats do cause mechanical abrasion through scratching. So that's the, the uppermost photo here on the slide. You can see scratching from bats roosting um, on a mud plaster in the same region, not in the temple, but in the same region of Luxor. Um, and of course, there are health and safety concerns associated with bats. Um, so fungus and bacteria can grow in their feces, whether um, these are fresh deposits of feces or even old deposits of feces. Um, so human contact with this material can be quite problematic. Um, of course, bats themselves can be carriers of diseases which can be communicated directly to humans. So rabies is a very well-known um, and high-risk one. Of course, there are other communicable diseases which um, bats can carry. Uh, coronaviruses being a recent um, famous example, which I'm sure we all have on our minds. Um, in addition, there can be cultural perceptions which can um, cause problems associated with bats. So sometimes uh, due to cultural beliefs, bats can have a very negative association for certain peoples. But in addition, there's often simply fear associated with unknown um, wild animal populations that you might not understand too much about and um, not knowing what the risk is associated with contact with those groups. 
Um, on the other hand, uh, I would like to emphasize very strongly that bats, of course, do have um, very positive impacts. And before I sort of mention the items which are listed on the slide, I would like to emphasize that, um, of course, bats are part of the natural heritage of the sites uh, that we are considering. Um, and that this alone is reason enough for, for me, and I would hope for others, um, for their protection. Um, however, humans do often need um, to have uh, reasons why certain animal populations have a positive impact for themselves in order to consider um, their protection more seriously. And so most of these uh, reasons listed on the slide, which I've shown here, uh, do have to do with positive impacts for human populations. So of course, bats, um, uh, have a very important role in the control of inside insect pests, pest populations. And that can be in the form of insect pests, which uh, are parasitic for humans, um, such as mosquitoes, and which actually can also carry diseases. So bats are instrumental, can be instrumental in controlling these populations. Um, and of course, also insects which attack agriculture. Um, and so of course, there's an economic corollary there. Um, bats also provide can provide a very important pollination uh, function. Um, seed scattering and the propagation of certain crops or um, vegetation. And they can also, their, their feces can serve as a source of fertilizer if people choose to use it as such. Um, so these all, of course, then you can imagine that it can be extrapolated to having um, positive economic benefits um, for maintaining bat populations near human um, communities. So here I've juxtaposed sort of um, the study and protection of bats in Europe and North America uh, with the protection and study of bats in Egypt. Um, other countries and regions could be added to the Europe and North America um, category as well. It's not just in Europe and North America that you see protections, protection and study of bats. Um, but this was just a way of sort of juxtaposing the, the strong difference um, in the understanding of bats in these two regions. Um, so for example, in Europe and North America, the bats have been extensively studied. Uh, the range of species and their behavior are well understood. Um, they benefit from legal protections. And in fact, uh, bats do benefit from legal protections in many other areas of the world. Um, I recently in preparation for this was sort of going over this material and it seems that they do benefit from protection in many parts of the world, except that in Africa and Asia, they don't benefit from so, ma so many protections. Um, and in those areas where they do have legal protection, uh, there are many studies and projects which have sought to balance the interests of bats and cultural heritage in, in sites. Um, in Egypt, on the other hand, there, at the time of the study, so this is in 2012, reviewing the literature, there was very little scientific study of bats um, and therefore not all species were known and their behavior was not uh, well characterized um, and there was no legal protection. And I have to say that um, reviewing quickly the literature in preparation for this talk, it doesn't seem that that situation has really changed much since 2012. I have to say that that's not terribly surprising um, given sort of the, the political complications and economic difficulties um, which Egypt is uh, experienced in the intervening years. So that I think that goes a long way to explaining why this hasn't advanced much. Um, in addition, I will say that where we were working in Luxor, uh, the local population, local people were afraid of bats, but I don't know if that's necessarily because of cultural beliefs or if that was simply because of, you know, being, having a reasonable fear of an unknown uh, wild animal population. Um, and at the time, of this study, there was only one previous publication which uh, discussed bats in the context of cultural conservation for the sort of for Egypt and the Luxor region. And now, of course, the, there are two, there may be more, but I haven't found any yet um, at this point. But certainly, uh, our publication from 2013 would be added to that list. But I think as I did a quick review of that as well and wasn't able to find much new literature for the region either in that regard. So when uh, faced with a bat, the inhabitation of a bat colony, of a, of a heritage site by a bat colony, and I, I refrain from saying infestation because I think it automatically has negative connotations. Um, the options for dealing with bats in a heritage site, there are basically three types. 
there's exterminations, you can kill them. Um, you can allow them to remain in situ or you can remove them um, in a way that attempts to uh, minimize risk to the colony. Um, obviously extermination was not considered at any point during this, this project and I don't think that it should be a consideration um, for the management of heritage sites. Um, which leaves us with uh, the two options, either to allow the bats to remain in situ um, or to remove them or exclude them. Um, and I should also point out that in some places where bats benefit from legal protections, their removal or exclusion is illegal. So this is not even an option in some places, um, unless you can demonstrate that you've undertaken a study of the situation um, and have justifiable reasons um, for removing the population, in which case it does seem that there are cases where you can request special permission to do so. But um, this is, you know, you, you really have to sort of justify the need for that kind of thing. Um, in Egypt, of course, there wasn't this kind of issue. So we had these two options available to us. Um, and as far as the factors which we considered during the decision to either leave the bats in situ um, or remove them, um, of course, we considered the significance of the site, which I mentioned at the beginning of the talk, so that it's quite a particular site, quite um, unusual for Luxor. Um, there aren't many temples from the same period and dedicated to the same cult as this site. Um, and we did have clear evidence that the bats were a source of active deterioration um, within the temple for the decorative surfaces and other aspects of the, the temple. Um, we also considered the short and long-term use of the site that was planned. So of course there's the field school, which I mentioned at the beginning of the talk. Um, which was going to be made up of a large number of people and also carried out over a two year period, um, during which probably overall at least one year would be spent within the temple. So that would mean quite a lot of contact between field school participants and um, the bats in a relatively small temple space. And then once the field school had been completed, the plan was for the site to be open to tourists. Um, and that tourists would be given access to all parts of the temple. So because of this, um, the health and safety concerns uh, were um, considered quite high um, for leaving the bats in situ. And I have to say that we also did consider the issue of the lack of protection for bats in Egypt. So we, um, during this sort of preliminary campaign, uh, conservation campaign before the start of the um, field school, it was a window of opportunity for, you know, taking the time to address the situation with the colony of bats in the temple. But we knew that once the field school started, that opportunity would not be as available. Um, and so it seemed that it was best to um, develop a solution while there was the opportunity and also while there was a team in place who was interested in and could take the time to dedicate research and time to developing um, a safe solution for the bats. And so for that reason, we did feel that it was probably best just to move them rather than leave them in situ. Um, and fundamental in making this decision and feeling that it was the best decision for this bat colony was the availability of good species specific advice from a bat biologist um, who made himself available to the project for, um, for giving advice on, this, on, this, on the decision and also the process of excluding the bats. And so the person who we were able to work with was Dr. Chris, Christian Dietz. Um, he's a German scientist at the University of Tübingen. Um, and in 2012, he was the only person who had written, well, the only book which was available about bats in Egypt had been written by Dr. Dietz. And in fact, it's still the only book that's available. Um, and it's available on his website as a free PDF download. Um, so this is the title page of that book now. Um, and I was able to get in touch with Dr. Dietz and he was willing via email, he wasn't in Egypt, um, but he was willing via email to discuss um, the issues and work with us throughout the process to design this bat exclusion. So in addition to the conservation 
um, considerations. So the, the considerations for the conservation of the temple, which um, I described as going into the decision-making process. Um, we also considered factors specific to the bats that we had present in the temple um, and their specific behavior in order to make this decision of whether to leave them or remove them from the temple. Um, and so some of the factors which we considered were the species of bats, their endangerment status, reproductive and other life cycle elements, um, their foraging activity, alternate roosts. So if they had other places where they could go to if they were shut, shut out of the temple, um, characteristics of their flight and movement and ideal roost conditions. And this last one was sort of used to try to, or not, not try to, to design a, um, an artificial roost space, which could possibly um, act as a replacement for um, living inside the temple. And so based on all of this information and in close uh, discussion with the bat ethologist, Dr. Dietz, um, we decided that removal was the best long-term option, uh, both for the bat colony and for humans, and of course, for the, the conservation of the site over the long term. So what do we mean by a bat exclusion? Um, implicit in the name um, is sort of the fact that this is a passive intervention. So you act passively and indirectly um, on the bats. So rather than capturing the bats, trapping them, and removing them forcibly from the space. Um, you simply uh, follow their normal movements in and out of the building, and at an opportune moment when they have left the building, you impede their return by closing off um, entrances. Um, and that is the, that's the, the controlling mechanism. This sort of prevents them from re-entering the building. Um, and a bat exclusion anywhere for any type of bat follows sort of a basic series of activities, um, a series of steps, and with some further development um, here and there as necessary for the particular case. So in the next series of slides, I'll walk you through the steps that we um, carried out and why at Gerald Shelby. So we started with a colony survey, um, and this is a common element of any um, bat exclusion. Um, and this is just sort of reviewing, uh, making observations of the bats in their, while they're living in the, in the monument or the site. Um, so this helps you to determine roosting locations, so where they tend to congregate. This can help you um, sort of determine, check on how many bats are left in the monument if you're excluding them. You could also use this information to decide which areas of a monument could be dedicated for bat use if you're deciding to leave them in sight. Um, the, um, the colony survey also helps you to determine sort of numbers of species that you're dealing with, the number of individuals who are living in your monument, um, and also if flightless young are present, which is a, was a fundamental question here and of course very important for any considered bat ex exclusion. Um, the uh, bats, when they give birth, their young cannot fly for at least a month after being born. Um, and so they're completely dependent on the adult, the adults of the colony who then will go forth, forage for food and return and feed the young. So if you were to exclude adults from a temple where there are sites um, where there are flightless lung, young, you're basically ensuring that um, this, that generation of bats would die off. And so this was one of the fundamental questions for us from the outset was determining whether or not there were flightless young. If there had been, we definitely would not have gone forward with any of these activities, but we did not find any. Um, what we found was that we had a colony of about 300 to 500 bats. Um, to us, it appeared that there was only one species. And this was just based on sort of observation of the individuals, but then also um, observations of sort of the movements and activity of the bats. And they tended to sort of move together from space to space and in different activities, which sort of suggested that it might be a single family um, colony rather than a mixture of species. Um, and we did also undertake photography at this point. Um, and that was important in the identification of the bat species that we were dealing with. So, um, I was able to send our observations and also the photographs to Dr. Dietz, 
who then was able to identify the bats for us. And of course, determining the species helps us to understand their rarity, potential sensitivities, um, timing, sort of life cycle. And Dr. Dietz was able to identify our bats as Acelia tridens, um, which are common insectivorous desert dwellers. Um, and here, the larger photo is of one of the Acelia tridens in our temple. The inset is just a photo that I took um, from the web so that you can see sort of the, the, um, their nasal formation a bit more clearly, which is, gives them their species name. Um, and they are listed as a species of, of least concern by the International Union for the Conservation of Nature and Natural Resources. Um, however, I'd like to note that it is the case that an exclusion always does put a bat colony at risk. And though the species is on the, le the list of least concern, um, it's important to keep in mind that bats worldwide are in, de um, in decline at the moment. Um, and so, uh, you know, the removal and treatment is not to be taken lightly, even for a fairly common species, I would argue. Um, so, and based on this um, identification of the species, uh, Dr. Dietz, so this was happening in sort of early April, um, and based on this, Dr. Dietz was able to confirm for us that the exclusion would be taking place in the period before the bats would be giving birth, that that probably wouldn't occur for another month um, after the time scheduled for the exclusion. And as I've said, we hadn't seen any flightless young yet. So he um, said that it was probably a safe and relatively low risk time to carry out an exclusion for this bat colony. Um, he also pointed out that because we had questions about what would happen to the bats once they had been removed from the temple, you know, did they have a place to go? how much risk would that put them at? Um, and Dr. Dietz indicated that uh, Acelia tridens, as well as some other bat species, do, are known to maintain alternative emergency roost sites in case their primary roost site is um, endangered, either by the invasion of a, a predator or some other factor, so that if they can't return to their primary roost site, they have other places, they have sort of a backup plan, they have somewhere that they can go. Um, so it was likely that they would already have um, alternate roost identified. So that risk was relatively minimal. Um, and in addition, this species is known to fly 10 to 20 kilometers in a night for foraging. Um, and therefore, given the proximity of the Theban mountain formations, where there are sort of caves and a lot of um, abandoned tombs, um, the so that for, those formations are only in about, within about four to five kilometers of uh, the temple site, that this would, you know, was easy enough for the bats to um, reach and also would still be in close proximity to the agricultural lands where they were undoubtedly getting their um, food and water. Um, and because of all of these factors, Dr. Dietz um, felt that the exclusion would not cause undue stress or risk to the colony. Now, there is always some risk, but it was felt that it was sort of minimal compared to leaving the bats in situ, um, given the plans for the, the future plans for the temple, for the use of the temple. So once we had um, studied the colony and determined what types of bats we had, um, the next step in this uh, bat exclusion and any bat exclusion is carrying out an evening bat watch. Um, and this helps you to determine what time the bats are leaving the site and what time they return to the site. So basically how long they're out foraging, what time they leave to go foraging and approximately how long they, they're gone. Um, and it also helps to determine the points which the bats are usually using to exit the site. Um, and this is important because the bat exclusion involves closing off sort of um, progressively closing off entry and exit points to the temple, to the site, um, in this case, the temple, um, until only a few entry and exit points are left. And then you begin um, preventing the bats from returning to the temple. So uh, we were able to identify 
sort of the, the major entrance or exit and re-entry points um, within the building fabric and also determined that the bats were leaving just about immediately after sunset and would be gone for about an hour after their departure every night. Um, the next step was, and I think my numbers are out of order here. Yeah, I skipped number four. Anyway, this should be number four. Um, the next step was to close off the minor access points in the building fabric. So um, bats can enter or can move through very, very tiny spaces. So Dr. Dietz recommended um, closing up any spaces which were larger than about a centimeter square. Um, and so once we, because in the previous step, we had identified the major um, exit and re-entry points within the temple, we left those open so that the bats could go about their normal activity. They remained in the temple during the day. Um, and at night they could use their main exit points to go forage and return. And during this time, we went about closing up all of the minor points within the structure, which could be used by the bats if their um, normal entry points were closed when they returned from foraging so that they could not get back into the temple via any other means. Um, and at this site, it required repointing of um, uh, joints between the ashlars um, and the sealing of certain cracks and mortar was used for both of these, of course. Um, and then we needed to close off some of the architectural openings, which led to the interior of the temple. So windows, doors, and skylights in particular. And a, a nice factor in having shifted the pilot campaign, so this initial conservation campaign at the temple, we'd shifted it from the focus on the remedial treatments, so the cleaning treatments, which had been planned for the sculptural polychromy, um, we shifted it to this focus on the preventive conservation, primarily with the bats, but this also allowed us to undertake other necessary um, preventive maintenance, such as repairing uh, the roof of the temple, where, from which we'd noticed that there were signs of water infiltration. Um, and of course, this had a dual purpose because sealing up a lot of the cracks on the roof uh, did also um, prevent uh, bat reentry into the, the temple complex. So for the doors and windows, um, we were using a system of wooden frames um, covered in stainless steel mesh. Um, and this was in part because, well, uh, the wooden frames, we couldn't attach anything directly to the historic fabric. Um, so all of these elements had to be put in place just um, using sort of wooden wedges to hold them into place, um, press them into place against the, the architectural fabric. Um, in addition, we wanted to use mesh and sort of minimize the, the impact upon uh, light and airflow into the interior of the temple. And this was partly out of a concern of creating sort of new microclimatic conditions which could um, have unforeseen conservation issues. Um, but also because we were very aware of not wanting to alter sort of the entry of light into the interior space because as I mentioned previously, um, the, the light really seemed to have, um, have had a role in sort of the ritual function of the space and also sort of the, um, the experience of the space currently. Um, so you can see here, this, the upper left photo is one of the windows be before the apertures were closed up. Um, below it is one of these wooden frames that we put in place. And on the right, you can see that we had sort of a double system. So there was the exterior frame and then on the interior, we had a second frame um, inside the temple. And then the final step was to actually exclude the bats from the temple. So once we had closed up all um, apertures, which could potentially have served as um, secondary entry points, um, once the bats had been shut out of the temple, uh, we went about closing off the, pri the openings which they normally use as their exit and entry points. Um, um, and this involved going to the temple in the evening, waiting until the bats left the space, and then simply closing off their exit points so that when they returned from foraging, they weren't able to re-enter the temple. 
Um, and this procedure had to be carried out over the course of a week because not all members of a colony will leave the roost site at once. So um, certain members will go out one night and come back and then other members will go out the next night and come back. And that's in order to always leave the, um, the roost site guarded. So you actually have to repeat the exclusion process over a series of nights. So in that case, we would, on the first night, we waited till the first group of bats left closed off all of the remaining or the, the exit points which they had used, um, left for the evening, came back the next day during the day, took the screens down off of their exit points, and that evening came back around sunset. The next group of bats would leave the temple and we would close it off. So uh, progressively fewer and fewer bats were left inside the roost, inside the temple um, over the course of the week. And by the end of the week, um, they had all left the temple site. Um, we were able to confirm. I think, um, you know, ideally what would have been a really fantastic element in this study would have been to follow, um, to somehow track the bats and see what happened to them when they left the site and actually be able to ascertain that, that they were going to an alternative roost site um, and to determine how, what kind of impact this activity had on the, the colony. Um, unfortunately, we didn't have that luxury at the time, um, but I think it would be a really interesting thing to do um, and important. What we did do, however, um, is in conjunction with this removal, we did design um, an alternative roost site or an artificial roost site might be a clearer way of describing it. Um, and this was based on sort of the known preferences of Acelia tridens um, in their roost site. So this was characteristics that we could see within the temple itself, but then also um, a, a population of Acelia tridens had been studied in Israel where they were found to be um, inhabiting abandoned military, underground military bunkers, which had the characteristics of being a small chamber, sort of fairly deep underground with a long tunnel that led down to it. Um, so very dark, um, long entryways seem to be preferred by the species of bats. Um, and so we took these different factors into consideration in the design of this artificial roost site. Um, so you can see here the, the proposed design. Um, it has this sort of circular um, layout so that you have a large area, but it's overall um, contained in a sort of small structure so that it's not, doesn't have a huge impact on the archeological landscape. Um, it was going to be built of, it was proposed to be built of adobe brick, which is uh, a material which is currently used in Egypt in the Luxor region for construction. Um, and so the local people know how to work with it. It's relatively cheap. Um, it fits in well with the overall landscape. And of course, um, if you have good thick adobe walls, it also provides a lot of thermal buffering. Um, it would have had this long sort of um, spiraling entry tunnel way um, and then a central chamber which would have had a, a separate dome structure. So it would have been a double dome structure with only a few entry points for airflow, minimizing light, but also uh, um, providing the bats with a number of entry and exit points. Um, also taking into consideration uh, the placement of the entry points so that predators would not be able to easily gain access to the interior chamber. Um, and we wanted to have it placed in the, um, near the temple, um, which is in the area located with the red circle, both so that the bats could continue to benefit from uh, this sort of sheltered area in the desert, but which is directly adjacent to this very rich agricultural land. Um, and that the people who were cultivating the lands in this area could benefit still from the, the presence of this bat colony near their lands. Um, but also as sort of another, another layer of preventive measures for the preservation of the temple. So hoping, uh, of course, there's no, there's no guarantee that the bats would have behaved in this way, um, but hoping that um, if there was an acceptable artificial roost site near their previous roost site, they'd be less likely to try and recolonize uh, the temple in the future. Uh, I have to say, unfortunately, 
because I was only part of this project during the pilot phase, um, I, I was not there to sort of push this idea ahead in future campaigns and the, the bat roost never was built. And I also think that that would be a really nice thing to revisit and make happen and could make a very, very interesting study. Um, so that, oh, sorry, sorry. Yes, that is um, the end of my uh, description of the, um, the exclusion at the Temple of Daryl Shewitt. Um, I hope that, you know, we really hoped that this study would um, serve as a model, at least in some ways, at least in the ways of thinking about dealing with wild animal populations at sites in Egypt, uh, because this is quite a significant problem at many sites and arguably one of the bigger problems at some sites, uh, both bat populations, but also birds of different types and things. So, and it, you know, there are a lot of, there are a range of solutions which are tried out at these sites, but often, you know, one of the, one of the recourses is of course to, to exterminating animals. So it was hoped that by offering this example of perhaps not necessarily needing to exclude a, an animal population, but at least um, sort of the thought process behind the, the, the decision-making could serve as a model in other areas. And also with the sort of um, the construction of these bat roosts and sort of looking at, are there sort of alternative ways that we can go about addressing this problem? Um, we hope that it has had a positive impact. Um, and I look forward to any questions you might have about this. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you, Jennifer. I think this was a very interesting talk. Yes, we do have questions. So yeah. with your permission, I'll start picking up those. Okay. So the first question of the day is, how was the surrounding ecology and environmental setting significant in this experiment? Hmm, okay. Let's see. I mean, the, the desert setting, let me see. I'm trying to, I'm trying to understand the question. Um, in the sense, did it help in a way, you know, that the fact that I believe, uh, Deep Thakur, are you there? You can unmute yourself. I think what he meant was the fact that there was, uh, you know, ecology and environmental setting, the way it was in that particular area, helped you with this experiment and it may not work in maybe other settings where such an ecology or environmental setting is not there. Yeah, That's I think certainly um, in the fact that there was a desert, there was a river, a water source. Yeah, um, yeah. You had the food source nearby as well and alternate roosting sites. Yeah, yeah. I think I think those are two important factors. The fact that there were there were um, geologic formations, just natural geologic formations, which in close proximity which could offer um, alternate roosting sites, but then of course also um, archeological sites, sort of old tombs that um, were already damaged and deteriorating that probably could also serve as alternate roosting sites. Um, and then yes, of course, the fact that you have directly adjacent to these areas, this very rich um, agricultural land, which of course would be full of insects and water sources. And so yeah, it, it definitely facilitates the decision making, you know, otherwise, if there if there weren't such resources around, one might not be so ready to evict an animal population, certainly. Thank you. The next question is, uh, may I know how the fecus um, of the bats in the surface material was cleaned? Was it a physical or a chemical process? I think that uh, is also related to the reasons of once the bats were excluded, how do you go about cleaning the bat residues? Right. Yeah. Yeah. So I think one advantage at this site as well was that um, a lot of the surfaces, well, one could consider it an advantage of some type. Um, a lot of the surfaces were already covered in soot, quite a thick layer of soot and dust. So unless there had been, I mean, it's possible that there had been bat inhabitation far in the past as well. Um, but certainly for the current colony of bats, um, it's possible that some of those surfaces were somewhat protected by that material. Um, and so um, the removal of the urine and feces could, would have been sort of undertaken at a similar time as the soot removal. And that was also one concern was leaving the bats in place and then this conservation program was going to come in 
clean off all of these surface deposits and leave sort of this important original polychromy exposed, if you still had the bats inhabiting in the temple, that would have been a really terrible situation because they would have been directly soiled by, by the bat feces. Um, in addition, um, there was a lot of, there were a lot of deposits, just sort of loose deposits of, of um, excrement on the floors. Um, and that actually we did undertake to remove some of in the areas where people were working during our component of the project. Um, and I mean, that's always risky, of course. And so we outfitted everyone with um, sort of appropriate respirators, uh, personal protection. We also undertook to remove the deposits in a way that created a minimum of dust. Um, but of course, it's always risky. Um, but then as far as the treatment of removal of um, urine and feces from the wall surfaces, that wasn't something that we undertook during that campaign. Um, okay. It was mostly just undertaking the measures to, to move the bats out and seal the, the temple so that the bats couldn't remove in order to then address the other issues. Thank you. The next question is, according to you, what do you think would have been a negative impact on the bad colony caused due to this exclusion? Uh, well, I think there are a lot of potential negative impacts. I think just the stress of being moved out of the, um, their roost space. Um, and really, you know, the use of the alternate roost, that is documented in this species of bat and others. Of course, we don't know specifically how this colony will have reacted. So. Um, is it possible that the individuals were split up? Could some have gone to one alternate roost site? Some of the others could have gone to others. I suppose that's one risk. Um, but I think definitely just the overall stress of that kind of major sudden change um, is risky for an animal population. It has to be recognized, so. Okay, thank you. The next question is, the removal of bats in some countries is illegal. So how do we really approach the bat population in those sites where the removal isn't an option? Yeah. Um, so there are a number of really interesting studies, which I didn't have time to mention here. Um, but for example, in the UK, just as one example, I know of some in Germany as well, where in particular sort of historic churches or historic um, houses, there are large bat colonies and they can't be removed. And so the solution has been to dedicate a certain portion of the site to the bats. So giving over a portion of a house attic or um, a section of the church to the bats. Um, and of course, you know, this has to be done in a way that uh, the bat population isn't disturbed by the ongoing human activity, but also so that humans aren't exposed often or on a regular basis to um, the byproduct of the, the bat's presence. Um, and then in preparation for this talk also, I saw a couple of really interesting studies in India actually, um, and one that argues very well um, for maintaining bat populations in situ. And they were talking about um, bat populations, very large colonies existing in a number of archeolo Indian archeological sites. And sort of, I think that they didn't um, implement any specific interventions during their study, but they had a number of interesting proposals for being able to manage this balance between um, animal populations and, and human activity within those, those sites and the, the sort of uh, the values that each population puts on these sites. Um, so I think there are, there are many, I'm sure there are many very interesting examples. It's just not something that I've looked into very deeply, yet, but yeah, it can be done. <laughs> Okay, I think uh, those are the questions. I had a small question, given the temple, the way it was, uh, those barriers that were put once the bats left, were left, I think, to not allow the bats to re-enter. That's correct, yeah, yeah. Even buildings where, you know, there are complications and it's very difficult to put barriers of those sorts, you know, complicated arch arches, Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Decorative elements, you can't block or shut it down everything. Are there any other ways to dissuade re-entry? Of course, exclusion can be achieved. And maybe do it, you know, maybe just not encourage them to come back. Are there any preventive measures or any means 
and does hear about the you know something like the ultrasound when when there was a lot of literature on ultrasounds and you know that back, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. and they do yeah. not like that or something but any practical applications in your mind or any other ways of deterring them to enter the space again once we have successfully excluded them yeah i think ultrasound is definitely one that has been used and has been successful in some cases um from what i've read and i'm definitely not an expert in this area um but from what i have read uh it also seems that light can be used to great effect um so if that's something that's acceptable for the site in question um you can use light particularly um of course in the evening at nighttime um illuminating spaces to deter bats um bat ingress that use of the spaces however that can have um unexpected or unwanted consequences um whether it's the the lights then attract another population of animals um or that the light impacts the site um mm-hmm. the original materials of a site or affects the microclimate all of those kinds of things so a lot of the interventions have um potential potential knock on effects i guess the ultrasonic solutions would be quite useful in that way um one of the like parts, be, yeah one of the participants is mentioning that mint mint is something that bats don't like the smell of mint so maybe uh-huh. using putting mint would be one of the options that and, sounds very nice yeah <laughs> <laughs> very pleasant solution yeah <laughs> yeah i know too oh, that's another one actually um i know that people sometimes use naphthalene okay um which is a subliming material um but i think that it might no i shouldn't say anything because i'm not sure i'm not sure if it's somewhat toxic yeah. anyway um no, mint that is sense. also used to deter so yeah mint might be a great option yeah, yeah. mint and menthol right? or menthol yeah 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 thank yeah. you for sharing that so in terms of questions i think that's all we don't have any more questions so thank you jennifer for taking out the time yeah thank you thanks thank for listening thanks so for doing the talk as you said it was an interesting talk very different from the ones we've had so far excellent okay good good i take this opportunity to thank you again the university of malta your division ruben is there kiara <laughs> yourself for doing this hopefully we'll again <laughs> and meet maybe even face to face thank you all for doing it thank you so yes thank you yes hopefully we get to meet someday yes yeah sure we will plan something once everything is done with <laughs> yes oh. hopefully yes thank you so much thank you everyone for joining us and taking out the time bye bye